think I have a pretty good grasp of the Bible and uh, how I teach it to my Sunday school class. Granted, I've been asked to step down a few times, but I mean, heresy is such a loose term these days. But I think if you put all the jigsaw pieces of the puzzle of the Bible together, I think I have a pretty good idea to teach anybody a little thing or two. Okay, so uh, share some of your knowledge with us. Okay, no problem on that one. Um, the Bible really doesn't get cooking until Moses built the ark. And the, wait, no, um, no, he was the one that parted the Red Sea. He was also the one that wrestled with God in the river of Gabok. And if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have been able to part that river too. But that was a foreshadowing. That was a prophecy for the New Testament when Luke would be in that river going, hey, I thought I could walk on water. And that was a foreshadowing of King Nebuchadnezzar telling King David, go get those people out of that water because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not belong there. And that is how King James became the greatest king of Israel. I believe in putting the words into action. You know what I mean? I mean, it's one thing to talk the talk. It's another one to walk the walk. All right? Case in point. I taught my kids the other day about David and Goliath, right? Now my youngest son, he's got mad skills with a slingshot. You know, I, I could tell you several stories of us, you know, putting the word into action. Uh, one of the most recent ones is I told my boys about, you know, Joseph and his brothers. And my oldest son, my oldest son, Tried to sell his brother to the next door neighbor for a coat. My little entrepreneur. Bob was proud. And it was a nice coat. I'm a big fan of the Bible. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's in most hotel chains. I have one. Probably two. I know I have a non-reading one in our living room. It's beautiful. It's right underneath our plaque that says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm such a fan. I became a fan of the Bible on Facebook. Big fan. So um, how often do you read the Bible? I'm a big fan. I don't see what the big deal is about, you know, memorizing scripture or carrying a big old clunky Bible everywhere. I mean, I have multiple translations of the Bible right here on my phone and on my digital reader, you know? And when I get to church, it's up on the screens. I don't really need to carry. I mean, carrying a big Bible anymore is just passe. Don't you think that having your own Bible helps you plant God's Word inside your heart? Really? So like, you know, thy word is a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? You talking like Psalm 119, 113? I'm sorry, I, I guess you do know quite a bit of scripture on your own then. Nope. Just Google it. This is my grandmother's Bible. She used to read to me out of this Bible when I was just a kid. She passed away this summer. A family member gave it to me because they knew I was a believer. To them, it was just a book. But to me, when I sit down and I read it, I see all her little notes. I see all the little highlighted pages, the dog-eared pages. I see the things that really meant something to her when God was speaking to her through his word. And I realize it's her legacy of faith that's passed on to me. That was passed from her parents to her. And you know what? It impacts my faith. More than anything, this truly is the living word. So one of my favorite all-time sports movies is Rudy. All right, everybody's probably seen that movie, haven't you? Rudy. So Rudy is a true story of an underdog. And Rudy was five something nothing, didn't have hardly any football talent, and he pushed himself, pushed himself because he wanted to be on the Notre Dame football team. He wanted to be one of the Irish. And so he trained and he worked and he trained and he worked. And then finally what happened? He made the team. He made the scout team, and then eventually he made the team, and he got to be on the field. And once he got on the team, he just stopped working hard, didn't he? He stopped training hard. No, he kept working and he kept training. Why? Because he was so grateful to be a part of this team. I remember years ago, it was 1994, me and my dad and 
Michael Cole and somebody else I can't remember, we went and we got invited to go see the Razorbacks that were playing Ole Miss at the Pyramid. And we got invited, somehow we got some connections with Rick Schaefer, who used to be the communications guy with the U of A, and he somehow made it happen where we got to go to the Pyramid and watch the team and their shoot around. We met the team, met Noel Richardson, Coral Swiss, and all these guys. I mean, I was 14 years old, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. We may even make a newspaper about it. And uh, that's one of my cherished memories with Michael Poe. You know, he died some years ago. And uh, anyway, we got a basketball, me and Michael both all got a basketball signed by the Razorbacks. Well, lo and behold, two months later, that team won the national championship. And so we now have, my dad and I, we have a basketball that is signed by the 1994 National Championship Razorback Back Basketball Team. A couple months or a couple years, I can't remember, went by and we were at a Razorback Back auction. We got to talking to people because that's what me and my dad do, we talk. Like, yeah, I come out naturally, by the way. Um, we were talking to people and come to, we just talking through things and, and was letting them know and share with this one guy the basketball we had. And we were standing there, and he offered my dad two thousand dollars for it. And before he could say no, I said no. Uh oh, we ain't selling that thing. It's two thousand dollars. That's a lot of money for a fourteen-year-old, fifteen-year-old. Why would I not jump on that? Because that basketball was a, a how we viewed it. It was a it was a, a a piece of treasure for us. We there was no way we were going to part with this thing. I tell people even now. I mean that was. 20 something years ago, I don't know. Uh, and I still tell people about that. And so that's how important that basketball means to us. It was a, a treasure that we viewed. So you're here today, and if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, you obey God, you live for God. You read your Bible, you come to church, you give, you serve, you tell people about Jesus, you share your faith, and none of that, not one thing that I just mentioned, will bring you the acceptance of God. None of it. Our acceptance comes through our faith in Jesus. That's how you and that's how I am accepted by God. Not all the things that we do. Not who we are. Our acceptance by God comes through our faith in Jesus and who he is and what he did. That's how you, that's how I, that's how we as the children of God, if you're here today and you're a believer, that's how we are accepted by God. And my question, as we jump into Hebrews 4 here, is we have this treasured gift called salvation. And the way that we know we have this treasured gift called salvation is through the treasured gift of God's Word. And so my question for all of us today is how do we view this timeless piece of treasure that we have? How do we view salvation? How do we view the Word of God? Because what we do, what you and what I, what we do with this precious gift called salvation is up to us. And are, are we going to find, as we're going to get into here in a minute, are we going to find ourselves like the Israelites? Remember, this is God's chosen people and they constantly disobeyed God. They constantly wanted other things. They constantly wanted other little G-gods. Because maybe, just maybe, they didn't know what this gift was. Or maybe, just maybe, they forgot how precious this gift called salvation was. And so the question for you and for me today is, what are we going to do with this gift called salvation? What are we going to do with this gift of God's Word? Because it really is up to you. And it is up to me. Every generation, every generation of Christians faces theological crisis. Meaning, 
There's always going to be false teachers trying to come in and pervert the Word of God. We have it now. We had it 20 years ago. We had it 200 years ago. It will always exist. There will always be somebody, even preachers, who will pervert the Word of God. And because you and I, if you don't believe this, we need to talk afterwards, but because you and I believe that the gospel is the only means by which sinners can be saved, then we must protect this with our dying breath. If we really believe that, if we really believe that this word truly is the only way we can get to God, and have a relationship with a holy and righteous God, then we must protect this with our dying breath. Why do you think you have a history of martyrs that we see in Scripture, that you see in the 18th century, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and even to this day, dying for their faith because they see this as a timeless treasure? There is a statement a theological statement is our foundational belief, and it goes like this. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we're going to see here in the first two verses of chapter 4, if you'll turn with me, and let me encourage you again. Your tablet, your iPhone, whatever, your, your, your actual book here, I want you to follow along with me. We'll have some supporting scripture on the screen that you don't have to turn to. There's books, there's Bibles in the back of the pew. I want you to follow along with me and read it as I read. Again, I remind people I preach out of the ESV version, whatever version you use, that's your choice. Uh, but I want you to follow along with me as we see by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. We're going to see how do we, how do you, how do I, how could have the Israelites entered into God's rest, and we're not talking about physical rest, we're talking about spiritual rest. How can God, how can the people of Israel, you and I today, enter into God's rest? And it is through that word called faith. So look at the first two verses in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them. He's referring to the Israelites. Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Here we have a word, promise, the fourth word of that, that chapter. And the word, therefore. Remember, if there was a theme for Hebrews or a second theme, the main theme is Jesus is greater. But the other one would probably just say the word, therefore. Because you see that word over and over and over again. And remember what I told you last week? It connects you to the preceding verses. When you see that word, you need to read the preceding verses. And so this writer is telling us something about the Israelite people that were in the wilderness with Moses. Now, let me just sidebar. New Testament's great. That's the New Covenant. That's what we're under. The Old Testament's just as great. Don't spend all of your time in the New Testament. Spend your time in the Old Testament, too, because it always comes back to Christ. And right here, and you see Jesus numerous of times when he's quoting Scripture, he's quoting the Old Testament. And right here, you see this writer quoting David from the book of Psalms. It's the entire Bible. Don't cherry pick it. It is the entire Word of God. From Genesis all the way to Revelation. You can even throw the maps in there if you want to. It is the entire Word of God. And so here we have the Israelites that have failed to enter into the rest of God because of their disobedience. And here we have God promised them rest perhaps in the promised land. But what this writer, what God is talking about goes beyond real estate. He, he wasn't saying if you enter into Canaan and you take possession of this, you're going to automatically have God's rest. Remember, God in this writer of Hebrews here is talking about spiritual rest. 
They could have, eventually, they did enter the promised land through Joshua, not Moses. And they still yet to find the rest of God because it was not found in territory. It was found in obedience, which they did not have. And so the first thing we see here in these two verses and in chapter 4 is the message of the gospel, just hearing it, just hearing the message of the gospel is insufficient for salvation. Yes, that's the first start. The book of Romans says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Yes, that's the start. It has to start up here in this old noggin, but it also has to go from here to here. You have to hear it with your ears, but... The message of the gospel has to go beyond just hearing. In fact, Jesus even says this. He says in Matthew, he says, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see but never proceed. Because the second component here that the writer talks about here that is necessary for the gospel, that is necessary for you and I to become a child of God, a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that word called faith. The only response, the necessary response to hearing the gospel must be believing in the gospel. Something that Israel failed to do. Something that Israel, even the forefathers, we see from the forefathers, and then you had Moses and Joshua and Aaron, and they're believing in God's word, and they're obeying God in his word. And the Israelites failed to do this because they heard it, but they did not believe it. And then last we see that this message of salvation was no different than those in the Old Testament. Yeah, now we have the New Testament. And, and our faith is in Christ. And, and because of the New Testament, we have a, a fuller and a more clear picture of God. But that is not to dismiss the Old Testament. Even Paul talks about this in Romans that says that Abraham... This is before the New Covenant. Even Abraham was justified by his faith. That is the word that hinges all of this. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Your faith. And our faith, if we have faith, there will be evidence of our faith. So we see the Israelites here. And what this writer is cautioning us and encouraging us and exhorting us to make sure we enter God's rest with faith. When you come to God, believe who He is. Believe that what He says He's going to fulfill, what He promises He's going to fulfill. But at the same time, when you and I come to God, don't forget to remember that he expects something from you and from me. It's not like one of these where you get saved and you can just sit on the sideline. No, God saves us to be a part of his army, to be a part of his church. And you have to know that from the start of your salvation. I would even say prior to your salvation that you're not just saved to go to heaven. You're saved to walk with God. So we see it's entering with faith. And then the second thing we're going to see in verses 3 through 10 is enter with urgency. Last week, it's hot. And I usually get my hair a little short, not real short, just a little short. And I told Abby, I said, you got to cut it off. I'm too hot. And she usually cuts my hair with a two. And I said, no, I'll do it one. She said, I'm not doing that. You're going to look like you have a buzz cut. I don't care. I don't care how I look. I'm hot. Just shave it off. I was urgent to get the hair off because I was so hot. That's why I looked like this. But I didn't care. 
all I cared about was being cool. Not like cool, look at him, he's cool. Y'all being like cool, like I ain't gonna be hot. When we come to God, do we come with a sense of urgency? Because sometimes I think we can fall into these traps where we've been given this gift and we take the gift for granted. Well, I already have God. You know, he loves me because of Jesus. He's already accepted me. So it's, it's all right, you know, if I don't live for him all the time. It's all right if I disobey him. I mean, he told me to do this, and I really don't want to do this, so I'm going to do something else. And he'll forgive me because of Jesus. He told me to do this, and I, I want to do my own thing, and it's all right. God's got to look the other way because he don't see my sin anymore. He sees Jesus. That is exactly opposite of what the Word of God teaches us. We should come with a sense of urgency, meaning that when we come to God, we come with the commandment to walk with Him in faithfulness and obedience. Something the Israelites failed to do. And because of that, they did not enter the full rest of God. So look at it says in verse 3 and 4. In Hebrews chapter 4. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, I has, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. You ever get restless? You ever just get antsy? Like, something's going on. You've experienced something. I need God to hurry up and do something. Come on. You get restless sometimes. Well, the writer here refers us back to Psalm 95, 11, where he says, Therefore, I swore, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, think about this. Who wrote this? David wrote this. The very David, the very King David... And this was after, this right here was wrote after the Israelites entered the promised land. After they were in the wilderness because they were in the wilderness because of their disobedience. But this David, this King David, think about who David is. What did he do? He committed adultery. He murdered someone. The Israelites, think about them. They were constantly sinning against God. We, even as Christians, we <coughs> sin against God. Why did the Israelites sin against God? Why did David sin against God? Why do you and I still sin against God? It's because in those moments we want and we seek something in our flesh that our flesh wants instead of being obedient to God and content with what He has given us. Did you know that in your flesh you are very prone to sin all the time? In your flesh and in my flesh we are very prone to be sinful human beings. Why is that? Because it is when we are in our flesh and when we react in our flesh we are seeking after ourselves and the things of this world instead of seeking after God and the things of Him. I can say this with the utmost confidence. When you are walking in faithful obedience with God, when you are living for Him, when you are grounded in this Word, you and I will not sin against God. It is when we're not doing those things that sin creeps in. I'm not saying that you're going to live this life never sinning. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that when we're walking with God in faithful obedience to God, you will not sin against God. Think about this. Me and Abby, Mary. If, if I were to decide to, to cheat on her, it's because... In that moment, I decided I don't want to be faithful to her anymore. 
But as long as that is my utmost desire to be faithful to my wife, that will not happen. Even when the temptation comes, if that is my utmost desire to be faithful to her, that will not happen. You think about the same thing. And if it is your and my utmost desire to be faithful to God in His Word, you're not going to cheat on God. It is when that is no longer our priority that that happens. And the Israelites weren't doing this, and that is why the psalmist here, David, and the writer of Hebrews constantly keeps reminding us of this. Anytime a writer in the book of the, in, in God's Word repeats himself, repeats himself, repeats, you ever have to repeat yourself to a person? Don't name that person. Don't look at your spouse. You ever have to repeat yourself to an individual? Why is that? Well, it's either something on you or it's because that person has given you the proof that they just don't listen to you. Or they just don't remember. I'm getting some eyelids, you know, back and forth here. Or they just don't remember anything that you say. So now because of that, you have in your mind, I gotta constantly remind this individual. Because I know they're not gonna remember or they're gonna forget. Why does the writer of Hebrews, as he goes into the end of verse 4, or into verse 5, in Hebrews 4 again, what does he say? They shall not enter my rest. Exactly what Psalm says. They shall not enter my rest. Why does the writer of Hebrews keep reminding us of this? And you see Jesus do this in Scripture too. If he says it two or three times, you must heed why does Jesus remind us? Why does the writer of Hebrews remind us of these things? You know why? Because as sinful human beings who are prone to sin, we forget. We shouldn't, but we forget. Some of this stuff sounds elementary, stuff that you've learned in Sunday school years ago. So why are we talking about it again? You already know it. But we forget it. We constantly need to be reminded of God's Word and who we are and what we need. And if we don't follow who we need, what will we turn into? And this is something the Israelites just didn't heed to. And this is why they stayed in the wilderness for years. How do we enter into God's rest? Today, wherever you're at, how can you find true rest in Christ? There is only one thing that can satisfy your restlessness. Because at, all, at some point in your life you have, and it's going to happen again, you're going to become spiritually restless. And there is only one thing that can satisfy your restlessness. And that is faith in Christ and obedience to Him. Those two things. That will satisfy your restlessness. I promise you, I can say this with the utmost certainty. When you have found yourself in your life when you didn't have joy, when you were angry, filled with anxiety, depression, worry, you were restless. I can say this with utmost confidence because I've been there too. You weren't walking with Christ. You weren't obeying Him. Because a Christian who constantly walks with Jesus and is faithful to Him and is obedient to Him will not experience the things that's out in that world. Will not experience the things and the emotions that lost people experience. Our prime example is Paul. There was probably perhaps hardly anybody else that was treated worse than him. And yet he could sit there in a jail cell singing praises to God. Why? Not because of his condition. Not because of his circumstances. Yeah. It was because of his relationship with Christ and his obedience to Christ. 
You will never, ever, ever, and I will never, ever, ever find more joy in this life than when you are walking in faithful obedience to Jesus. Why? Why is that? Because that's what you were created and saved to do. That's why you were created. And that's why you were given salvation. To walk with Jesus every single day in faithful obedience. That is how we find true rest. Look what it says in verse 8 and 9. In Hebrews 4. It says, Since therefore it remains for... Oh, that's verse 6. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So here we have the introduction from the writer of Hebrews to Joshua. Moses, as we said just a moment ago, Moses did not lead the Israelites into the promised land. Joshua did. But as I said earlier, this rest was not found in a territory. It was not found in the land itself. It was not found in real estate. Even though Joshua led them into the promised land, it was God who led them into full rest. And that full rest didn't come in the land itself. It came in God. And it came in obedience to Him. Let's say, for example, today, I were to give you a car. Brand new. You pick it. Brand new car. We're going to go to the dealership right now and get it. But I have a condition. Before I give you the keys and the title of this thing and you get in and drive off, I have a condition. You have to detail this thing from the hood all the way to the rear and the inside and everything. You have to fully detail it every single day. And the moment you don't, I'm taking it back. That's the condition. How long is that going to last? How long is that motivation going to last? At some point, you're going to get tired. You're going to be like, it is 95 degrees outside and that car is clean. I just did it yesterday. I know it's clean. So I got to do it again today? That Brother Marty is crazy. Here, you can have the car back. That's going to wear you out. But on the opposite, what if I said... Here is you a brand new car, free, no conditions. The only thing I ask is you take care of it. Verse 10 captures the gospel in its full essence when it says, read it with me. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, from his works as God did from his. <clears throat> the only way that you and I can find true rest in God is by trusting the work of Christ, not your work and not my work. It's kind of like that hamster on the wheel. It never stops. You get tired, don't you? You get tired and tired and tired when you realize that there's somebody right there who'll spin the wheel for you if you'll just stop trying. The moment we realize that, the moment we realize that it is not about your works and my works, but it's about Jesus and his finished work, that will provide true rest. And I am convinced that that will also give us the motivation to not walk away from God, but to walk with God. Because we know that there is somebody who has already and is continually acting on our behalf. Then in verse 11 through 13, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hid from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall to, by the same sort of disobedience. Now, yes, salvation by grace 
you have it, I have it, it's free. It came by the result of Jesus and his finished work and our faith in him. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. But what if, if we lived a life that had a desire because of this gift to not live a life in hopes that we'll get it, but live a life that already has it, Maybe just maybe we wouldn't fall into these traps and snares of disobedience and falling away from God that the Israelites did. And that word is called perseverance. The opposite of perseverance is disobedience. The moment we stop trying, not in hopes to get salvation, but because we do have salvation, the moment we stop trying and persevering and enduring this life to be obedient to God every day, the moment that we stop doing that, disobedience happens. The moment we stop doing that, we begin to negotiate with God. That's laughable. Perseverance is what the writer in Hebrews is talking about here. And then secondly, in verse 12, look what it says. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. For the Word of God is living and active. Think about the medical technology that we have today. You, you go in, you're sick, you got some stuff going on with your body, and you go to the doctor. And usually the first thing that they want to do is what? They want to draw blood. Sorry for those of you who don't like needles, but they want to draw blood. So what do they do? They prick your skin. They penetrate your skin to get the blood out. And then they test the blood to find out, is there anything in your body that your blood is detecting that's not supposed to be there or that needs attention? That's what this book does. This book exposes things that we're not supposed to be and not supposed to do. But how will you know that if you're not in it, if I'm not in it? We won't have these things exposed to us because this is the book that does that. It tells us this is not what belongs in your life, Marty. This is what does belong in your life, Marty. That is why this book is not just for your salvation. It is for your sanctification. That is why I cannot say this enough it is vitally important to your life that you are in this book every day. How will you know what needs to be removed from your life? How will you know what needs to be added to your life if you're not in it? This book is, it calls it, the writer says it's living. That means that it is alive. Jesus is alive. He is the author of this book. So you're not reading a dead document. That's got dust on it. You're reading a document that is alive and well and speaks to you. Yeah, God still speaks in different ways. But this is the primary way that he speaks to his children. You want to know what God has to say about something? The Bible and prayer. You want to know what you're supposed to do with your life? Bible prayer. You want to know how to combat against sin that you're struggling with? This right here. You want to know how to be and grow in your faithfulness and obedience to God? That right there. It also says that it is active. This book is living and active. Look at what 1 Thessalonians says. It says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men. Yes, men wrote this, but they were inspired by Almighty God, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in believers. You ever had surgery before? Michael can attest to this probably as a PT and a guy who had shoulder uh, repair. But you, you have the shoulder, you, you mess up your knee, you mess up your shoulder, your hand, whatever. You go and um, you have surgery on it and everything. Well, what happens if you come home and you don't have rehab? 
I can answer this. You get stiffened, don't you? And it's hard to move whatever that is that that you had surgery on. I, I need to have knee surgery at some point, and my doctors told me, but when you do it, you're gonna have to do re re constantly, constantly rehab, because if you don't, those knees are gonna stiffen up, and they'll have to go in there and repair it and do all this other sort of stuff. If you don't do those things, you become stiff and stagnant. When we don't remain in this active word, and that word remain means don't part, abide, stay in. When we don't remain in this active word, when we don't obey this word, you know what happens? We become stiff, we become stagnant, and we become more prone to sin. You want to know why it's you or me, like, I don't know why I just can't shake this one sin. I'm constantly struggling with it. Not being tempted with it. I'm talking about giving in to the temptation. You want to know why that happens? Why you can't overcome the sin? Because you're not in the power of the word that will overcome the sin for you and through you. That's how powerful this word of God is. It's living. It's active. And the last thing in verse 12 that says, it's piercing. What's one of the, the most valuable tools other than their knowledge that a surgeon uses? A scalpel. They use that scalpel to cut you open and to maybe take out things that are making you sick and maybe replace it with something that's going to make you healthier. This is God's scalpel. And when we're in it, he's wielding it. And he's penetrating us all the way through bone and marrow and seeing things that doesn't need to be there and seeing things that does need to be there. And he reveals that to us. He tells us, Marty, you need to remove this from your life and let me remove this from your life. And, and instead of that, you need to let me replace it with this because he's, he's slicing me open. He's cutting me open. And he's seeing me to my inner core. And I'm seeing this. And he's revealing this to me. You find me a book that's more powerful than that. You find me a book that's more powerful than revealing sin. And replacing it with how to overcome sin. And I'll sit down. But you won't find me a book that's more powerful than that. And then lastly, in verse 13, he says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Years ago, I probably shared this before, but several years ago, I had my gallbladder removed, went to the hospital, was in deep, deep pain, and, and something was going on, and, and they found out when they did a scan on me. They did one of those radioactive scans. They injected me with radioactive dye, and I thought, well, the last time I saw a guy do this, he turned into Spider-Man. So maybe I'll turn into Spider-Man. Well, that did not happen. But anyway, they did this. And so but because of that scan and that dye that they injected me, they found out my gallbladder was sick and needed to be removed. They exposed what was sick and what was wrong with me. And so because they found out what it was, they were able to take it out. God uses his word to reveal to us and expose things about us that does not belong. God uses his word to help us to recognize, to repent of things, and to be renewed with things. He uses his word to do that. That's how valuable this book is. How valuable God's Word is. And the question from you and for all of us, for me, is we say that, don't we? There's not a person in this room who would disagree with that. Do our lives say that? There's a saying that goes You sold me a Bible that's fallen apart. And I'll show you a life that's not. You show me a Bible that's falling apart. I'll show you a life that's not. 